I've got to clean that afterwards. Good morning and welcome to you as Gift and I lead you through session four of our Lenten series, which has been looking at the Lord's Prayer. And today we look at what translates in the Greek as forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. I was thinking about this whole subject of debt when I was writing this, and I was reminded that Queen Elizabeth's mother, the, the Queen Mother as she was called, lived to the grand old age of 101. When she died at the age of 101, she had an accumulated debt of the equivalent of $9 million. That's quite a little hefty sum. Having regularly overspent her annual allowance and having had to be bailed out by the Queen and Prince Charles on numerous occasions throughout her life. So the Queen paid her mother's debts and of course she inherited her estate. But one bank cancelled the entire debt that the Queen Mother had racked up which amounted up to a very sizable amount indeed. And of course as a result of this action the bank's chairman was rewarded with a title in the Queen's honors list. So sometimes you must actually give away something in order to get something bigger. At the same time that this happened, an ordinary citizen wrote in to a newspaper to speak of the double standards of banks. He said, the Queen Mother's debt was remitted, but his mother's debt was not. So as a pensioner, she who had also lived through the war and raised children and worked lost the council flat she had bought and was staying in. And her debt was very small in comparison to the Queen Mother's. It's a very human story, I believe, but it conveys the problem of debt, the inequality of dealing with it. Nurse can equally be applied on a much bigger scale to uh, debts between nations. Wealthy nations like the US are allowed to rack up an accrued debt to the equivalent of $30 trillion. Can you imagine that? I don't even know what a trillion might look like. All I know is that if I had a trillion, I wouldn't be able to spend it in my entire life. Um, and the US will never actually be able to pay this amount in full. And smaller nations are subjected to austerity measures, quite extreme austerity measures, resulting in cuts to exp in expenditure to areas like the public health sector. Dubey tells us that many of the two-thirds world countries are worse off now than they were pre-independence and that they, mo they owe more than they can ever produce as a nation, so you can actually see that this is a really big problem worldwide. Now, if you are saying to yourself, but where does forgive us our debts come from? Surely this man has got it wrong. The Lord's Prayer clearly says, forgive us our sins, forgive us our trespasses. Then I want to say you must return to Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer which has exactly these, um, these verses in it. Whilst Luke says, forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone indebted to us. So you can see the idea of debt and sin. So we have to look at why debt was such a big problem in Jesus in time in order to understand why Matthew and Luke both have this idea of debt and indebtedness. Now, Musa Dube Shimana Shomana points out that ordinary Jewish people living in Israel in, in the time of the Roman Empire owed debts. They paid tax to Rome. They paid a tax to the temple. And since many were what we would call um, seasonal, seasonal farmers, um, they working on the land owned by absentee landlords, and they had to uh, pay them tax 
as, as well. So she points out that many, too many people lived on the land. Um, people had bigger families in those days, no birth control. Um, and in many cases, if you live off the land constantly, generation after generation, it can lead to infertility or if the climate changes a little bit, um, the land, some land becomes infertile. And of course, if there were too many people living on the land and wasn't producing enough for them, that led to unemployment and um, further debt. And we all see this. We're going to read a text from Matthew a little bit later, Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 to 35, but we are going to do that. Um, so, Dubé writes, Praying for the forgiveness of debts in the Matthean context was therefore not a spiritual utterance that had nothing to do with the economic structures of the day. Rather, it was a direct comment on the economic structures of Palestine in the time of the Roman Empire. The Lord's Prayer was suggesting that unmet taxes and unpaid loans must go. Now, I would want to add to what she is saying here, that in the Old Testament, there was the concept of the year of Jubilee, meaning every 50 years, if somebody had been in debt and had sold you their land, that land had to be returned to the original owner. And if you, through debt, had become a slave, you had to be set free um, from slavery. And this was because God had liberated, the theological understanding was God had liberated the people from uh, Egypt. And so, in response to the generosity of God, you should therefore be generous to other people in return. The Lord's Prayer, however, is not saying that we must avoid taxes or the paying of loans. Rather, it is a challenge to the systemic structures that lock many responsible, hardworking individuals and nations into a vicious cycle of poverty and debt. I was reading just the other day of um, somebody who in Australia works as a big, very big NGO feeding people. And they said that many of the people who come for food parcels are not people who are unemployed. They're simply not earning enough to make ends meet. And the only solution, therefore, they said to this would be to raise people's actual salaries so that they can actually feed themselves. The vision of the Lord's Prayer indicates that in imposing impossible debts on people through oppressive and exploitative international and national policies is inconsistent with the rule and will of God in heaven or on earth. It does not resonate with the role of hallowing God's name on earth. You remember we dealt with what it meant to hallow God's name. And we, we discussed in that how God is really compared with a householder who um, provides adequately for all the members of the household so that there is no want or no lack. Dominic Crossan, in his treatment of the Lord's Prayer, says the biblical concern is that all must have enough if they don't have enough, there is a challenge to see how we are going to ensure that they do have enough. He says, when we think about justice in the Bible, the, the, the word means distributive justice. To be just, he says, means to distribute everything fairly. The biblical tradition speaks of a God as a God of justice and righteousness. A God of justice and righteousness is a God who does what is just by doing what is right and does what is right by doing what is just. I like that. I, I like that play of words, justice and righteousness. Now we're going to ask you please to read this text that I made reference to from Matthew chapter, 20, uh, chapter 18. Sorry. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven 
may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and the children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing, seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I'll pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw and heard what happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgive you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. So uh, we must remember that when we read these texts, you're not allowed to take them literally. So God is not going to torture you if you don't forgive somebody else. You're probably more likely to torture yourself if you don't uh, forgive somebody because if you withhold forgiveness uh, you keep it in yourself and that is not a healthy thing to do so on the basis of this reading um, what is the relationship between forgiveness debt, sin and God for me um, forgiveness is seeing that is the act of God, which sets us free, free from the power of evil, free from sin, free from death. And in the, holding the idea that debt is the obligation to pay back, be it in monetary form or be it in whatever value have to be paid back. And um, with sin being seeking our own will instead of the will of God, and therefore, that messes up our relationship with God and with other people we live with. Yeah, I, I've already said something really about um, um, forgiveness. It worries me that so many people are caught up in cycles of debt. And there's something wrong when people can't find enough to sustain themselves. Um, and I think that it is related to sin in the sense that banks loan money. They can loan money very easily. So do credit companies. And then there are a whole lot of illegal ones as well that will um, loan you money at very, very high uh, interest rates. And they don't do proper credit checks on you to see whether you should be allowed to take out um, such a loan. Um, and banks are quite happy to give you loans until a certain point where they then call, call in everything. And that's usually, by that stage, everything is usually too late to deal with your um, your initial um, problem. So debt for me 
is something that actually imprisons people. They are imprisoned in an obligation towards other people and I think it also leads to self-worth problems. It leads to people not being able to live life freely when you have a debt hanging over your head and you don't know how you're going to, to pay it. It almost can become quite a sole focus of your life um, to, to a degree. Um, and then when you're not free, you can't be who God intends you to be. Um, so the idea of debt is a very, very, very powerful um, idea in, indeed. Um, I, I sort of think of the way I understand it is, is um, when it comes to myself personally, if somebody wants to lend money, I consider carefully and then usually I say, I will give that person the money as a gift, if I can. That way I'm free. If they ever choose to give the money back, that's great. But if they can't ever give the money back, it doesn't damage my relationship with them. I have chosen to freely give of my money. And I'm therefore not imprisoned by money. Our money can so easily become a way of damaging our relationships with, with other people. So let's look a little bit more at this relationship between forgiveness and debt. Now here we come into looking at something about how the Bible is written, the kind of styles of writing in the Bible. Chrisan points out that not only is the Lord's Prayer based on the biblical understanding of justice, but it is also part of the tradition of biblical poetry in which a first line, a second line repeats the first line differently in order to make us think differently. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those in debt to us. And what we're meant to be asking is, is the writer saying the same thing twice or expanding what is said the first time round? And here you have mention of debt and debtors. The text actually wants us to meditate on these words, to take them uh, very, very, very seriously. Krasan also suggests that there was a, a movement in time which is reflected in the differences between Luke's prayer and that of Matthew's from debts to trespasses to sin. And he says you can already see that in Mark's passage, and I'm going to ask you please if you've got it to read us, Mark chapter 11 verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. So here you get the idea that um, forgiveness is related to the concept of some form of tr social transgression uh, that is, is happening, okay? And that's continued in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 to 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Okay. And then finally we look at something, and for those who actually have the text in front of them, please, I made a mistake. It is Luke chapter 11, verse 4. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, 
but deliver us from the evil one. Now I can see you using the King James Version because in the, and that will come to next week, so we're not going to talk about that, but uh, revise, new revised standard and do not bring us into the time of trial. Okay, you can take some time to mull over these, these various different texts for yourselves, but what I was really trying to show is the development of this, this idea. In Matthew's Gospel, we move from literal debt, that's 6.12, to trespasses, which you'll find in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 to 15, and then we move to an understanding of sin. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35, which is that passage that we read. So while there is, continues to be debate about whether sin and trespass are the same thing, it's, it's, it's actually really, when you start to think about it, you can see that these two words are closely linked to each other. Klotz writes that the word translated as sin, and here he's talking about the Aramaic translation of the Lord's Prayer, can equally be translated as failures, mistakes, accidental offenses, frustrated hopes, or tangled thread in an Aramaic. Croissant says that Jesus probably meant literal debt, but that this understanding was then developed by Mark and Matthew and then Luke. So he writes, it seems advisable to read Matthew's text as including both debt and sin. Not debt alone, not sin alone, and certainly not sin instead of debt, but both together. Indeed, the ultimate challenge may to be to ponder on their interaction. And at least for the biblical tradition, when debt become, creates too much inequality, it has become sinful. So what we are asking for in this prayer is to be released of debt that we may be free because we in turn have released others of their debts. These debts are indeed monetary, but they are also that which tangles our relationship with God, creation, and others. It's not a case of an either or, but it's a case of a both and. Um, before we close in the Lord's Prayer, I think that I'm gonna take people through the meditation that we've got, a meditation by Klotz, Neil Douglas Klotz, on that, on that phrase that we've just spoken about. Loose the cords of mistakes binding us as we release the strands we hold of others' guilt. Forgive our hidden past, the secret shames, as we consistently forgive what others hide. Lighten our load of secret debts as we relieve others of their need to repay. Erase the inner marks our failure makes just as we scrub our hearts of others' faults. Absorb our frustrated hopes and dreams as we embrace those of others with emptiness. Untangle the knots within so that we can mend our hearts, simple ties to others. Compost our inner stolen fruit as we forgive others the spoils of their trespassing. Loose the cords of mistakes binding us as we release the strands we hold of others' guilt. I think it's a really beautiful meditation. I think people can make, take time to just go through each of those little paragraphs separately and pray them deeply. Let's close by saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, Amen. hallowed, hallowed be, your be your name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come. Your, your will be done, be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. By the way, next week we won't be dealing with the, and we won't end 
Lord's Prayer we, when we finish next week with the final one, with the, the last words, the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, because that is not found in the biblical text. In